in architecture over the last 80, 100 years has been what, what, what appears to be a need on the part of architecture to associate itself with other larger issues, conceptions, disciplines, subjects that purport to explain the world in a certain way into which architecture makes an effort both to fit and somehow to use the language of a very different way of working and thinking as a way of making itself appear to be progressive or new or forward thinking. I can give you a couple of examples, and they're crude examples, but for instance, the Corbusier in Algiers, which arguably is, belongs to Gris, Brock, and Picasso 25 years earlier. Or the Corbusier talking about they do it with cars, why don't we do it with buildings? And the association of industry and technology outside of architecture with an interest of industry, of, of, of the language of industry and technology inside of architecture. Um, then there were uh, the metabolists, and Tanya was a teacher of mine at, 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 at the GSD, but Kikutake, Kurosawa, Kizutake, and others, and, and metabolism, which purported to be an association between human physiology, the human body, medicine, physical sciences, and architecture. Uh, and then perhaps finally Paul Demond, who was a literary theorist, and was involved in a discussion that was referred to as deconstruction in architecture coming to be associated with that. And maybe finally a rerun of the interest in the assembly line machinery and technology, the association between architecture now and contemporary way and new kinds of technologies, digital technologies and the capacities, the representational and fabrication and so on, that, that those technologies allow or make possible for us a somewhat different kind of building and drawing and so on and so on. Uh, and, uh, and maybe maybe to start somewhere as opposed to everywhere, you could you, maybe maybe this is this is either too much or too broad. And you could talk a little bit about over a long period of time and watching a number of vantage points and advocacies move over time and how you guys, your office, your firm, your work belongs to or disassociates itself from what is what is uh, a dominant or a predominant kind of conceptual argument, intellectual argument, pro forma. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>
that schools develop their voices. Uh, and uh, as I say, SciArc has been a model of that aspiration. And I would say the successful fulfillment of that aspiration over many years. And of course, one of the things it's especially, especially important because SIRC is not a state school. It's not associated with a great university. It is what it is. It's, and you all know the history better than I do, but, and, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to try to pick up on what Eric said, or part of what he said, but probably not in the way that that he expected. Um, I'm very much, first of all, I'm not a theorist. I'm certainly not an idealist. I am something that is not terribly fashionable in the world of architecture today, but unavoidable, I have to say, and I'm a humanist. That is to say, I believe that the fundamental task of the architect is to illuminate and give meaning to the human condition through what we know. Uh, and to me, the voice of architecture has to do with the fulfillment of that aspiration. There's a particular aspect of that that I want to touch on today because um, it has nothing to do with methodology, has nothing to do with style, has nothing to do with advances in technology. It has to do with something that in my view transcends all those issues and is literally timeless. That is the peculiar and notable capacity that architecture has to respond to ambiguity, paradox, and conflict in the program of society that buildings are asked to serve. Um, that fascinates me. It is sort of at the core of my practice, the attempt to think about how architecture can, that's what I mean by illuminating and giving meaning to the human condition. It's that aspect of the human condition that particularly fascinates me. Uh, the way in which architecture doesn't suppress, but actually celebrates the conflicts that are inherent in the problem of society, but at the same time reconciles them, makes them something that you want to think about, that stimulates uh, the culture, I would hope. Now, let me just, because I'm not much good at generalizations, and in fact, it's really boring, but let me give you an immediate example from history, uh, from here one of the most vivid examples because it's the example of what for me is uh, well, somebody were to tell me that all the buildings ever built were going to be destroyed except one, you can choose that one, I would probably choose Hagia Sophia. And one of the reasons I would choose it is precisely because of the way that building manifests that capacity of architecture to illuminate, in a certain sense, celebrate, and at the same time reconcile to keep ambiguity and paradox in the society that is possible. And it's very simple, if you just, I'm sure you all know that building. The characteristic of that building is that fundamental characteristic is that <clears throat> it is a domical building form superimposed on a basilican groundwork. Now a basilican 
credit plan, of course, is a rest which is fundamentally a procession. Uh, the silicon plants originated in Greece and became the, of course, principal motif, if you will, the principal form of early Christian churches because of their processional aspect and the liturgy associated with it. In other words, there is a progressive nature to the silicon ground. When you enter at the end, you can see the one end, you can see the other end, there's a habit or something. And along the way, there's a series of columns. It's a celebration of progression. Progression, well, Contradictory prospects 
and resolved. And whether when one makes something which is not what one knows, as opposed to making something which one already knows, whether there's a way of reading in the making of a building the fact that the process is moving in a direction one doesn't quite recognize, meaning, in a sense, finished or less than finished, or complete or working towards something which is not less complete. Because I have a feeling the reading of Hajj Sophia is an idea which is understood, as opposed to an idea which, maybe in a different form language, would be an experiment trying to do something and almost inevitably not succeeding. So the question is, is it finished or is it in process? Well, you know what I mean? Physically speaking, of course, it was in its time one of the most completely finished buildings we ever made. For one thing, the interesting thing about Isophia is the treatment of surface, which Thomas Pierce were once covered and some of them still are covered with mosaics, uh, which has an extraordinary effect on the architectural presence of the building. There is, there is a program of information, or propaganda, or whatever one wants to call it, delivered by the building as well and through, through graphic means as well as the architecture. I would say that to me it's not a question of whether the building is finished, it's a question of whether the building has finished is experimental. And and whether that idea of its experiment uh, has uh, has durability. And in that sense, I think that I Sophia is one of the most durable experiments. But this is really done. interesting here because the, the, the more contemporaneous discussion of experiment, euphemistically speaking, suggests loose ends. Well, the, you know, the, yeah, that is the, the that language is. That, that purports. But you see, there is a loose end in I Sophia. The loose end is not in the construction, the loose end is in the very attempt to do this. The very attempt, by the way, which you know, is essentially unique in history, from the history of architecture. I mean, there are many, many dominant structures which are almost always uh, symmetrical uh, on all sides, as indeed the great mosques are in Istanbul. One of the greatest is just a few blocks away from Hagia Sophia. It is totally static, totally resolved. See, the thing about Hagia Sophia is that it's an unresolved, but it has nothing to do with the level of finish. It has to do with the very concept of it is that it's unresolved. Is the irresolution intelligible to the people who inhibit it? I, I, whether you said intelligible is hard to say, but uh, I think it, it accounts whether one whether everybody was analyzing the way that I guess it accounts for the extraordinary force of that building, emotional force of that building. It certainly, I mean, it is in fact one of the great structural tour de forces of all time. But if you look at it as a structural tour de force, it doesn't begin to explain the emotive force of the building. So, uh, and, and I, I'm only offering my own interpretation and I was my interpretation is that that emotive force stems directly from the uh, lack of resolution from the argument, if you will, okay. between two ideas about the world uh, which are brought together in a way that uh, is extraordinarily powerful because of the other now, let me turn to uh, something 
much closer to him because it struck me this morning, Andrew and I will go over to Tom Main's uh, file transfer. And th th this may strike you as trivial after High Sophia, but <laughs> I don't think it's so trivial. Caltrans is an enormous institutional building which is us, and again, this is what the program of society has asked that building to provide a huge volume of bureaucratic space. It's a bureaucracy. Uh, it's, it's undeniably, unambiguously a bureaucratic building. There's no way you can avoid being that even if it were not being value engineered or whatever. It is what it is. What I admire about what Tom and his colleagues did in that building is that they juxtaposed that demand for a vast bureaucratic structure with all the services that that bureaucracy is providing. They juxtaposed that with an aspiration to deliver an idea about public life and public space. And it did it in a way that did not try to soften or mediate or blur the kind of almost mindless bureaucracy of the building. On the contrary, it celebrated it, albeit very skillfully, and juxtaposed it with an extraordinarily powerful idea about the engagement of the public with that building. It's not just the engagement of going in to do whatever stuff the public has to do there. I'm not sure actually what the public does do with that. I know it's hard to get into we couldn't go. But but what but what the building delivers is an idea about the relationship between government service, the services provided by government and the public life of cities, which is extraordinarily powerful in that space. And why is it powerful? Because it's not just simply in front of the building in the conventional way of, that we all know about, which has failed so totally in my time as an architect. The idea of, well, if you're going to build a big bureaucratic building, put a plaza in front of it for the public. That kind of juxtaposition doesn't do anything to them. has been, you know, all across this country, there are, um, in every city, there is a failed tower or a failed plaza in front of it. It doesn't work. The genius of Caltrans is that that bureaucratic building is engaged with that public space. By the way, that's why the plaza in front of the building, Andrew and I agree, is much less successful because it is simply a plaza in front of the building. But the space that really sings and really makes that paradox vivid and meaningful is the space that you enter, which has the sign and the terrace uh, uh, amphitheater on the street side, and then it goes through and into the building. And when it gets into the building, it explodes upward to that extraordinary atrium, and through the building, literally, to that slot of space and light that's beyond. Now that's extraordinary. You know, I only, I'm mentioning it because this is a building that I'm sure you all know, probably better than I do, but it exemplifies, it, uh, I hope that what I've said about it shows you why this notion of, about what architecture does uh, so engages me. It has to, now, to be sure, uh, speaking of loose ends, one of Tom Main's great skills is the skill of creating raw ends, you know, raw ends of things. They're, never, they're not finished, they're cut off. There are lots of cut off raw ends. Uh, and that's a device which is important to understand and to analyze. But what I'm talking about, and I hope I've succeeded in beginning to make my case by juxtaposing the eyes of the and culture, <laughs> is that it transcends time. It transcends time. It's a fundamental uh, capacity that architecture has 
And like every art, architecture has a voice, and that voice is distinctive. And why does that voice matter? Because through the voice of architecture, things are communicated which cannot be communicated in any other form. That accounts in any, through any other mode of expression. That obviously is what accounts for the value given to architecture for the reason that we, we see it as a fundamental manifestation of our culture because architecture is doing something in a way and with greater effect that no other art form can do it. For example, again, going back to Hayes and Fio, but even to culture, has lots of, you can write a lot about that idea of an unresolved paradigm. But when you see it realized in architecture, you are confronting a work of art in the definition that I've always been very fond of, that Paul Valerie gave to it when he said, we recognize the work of art by the fact that no idea is inspires in us, no mode of behavior that it suggests we adopt could exhaust or dispose of. That's what architecture does. It totally transcends it. through its art, it trans it transcends the mere statement of the idea. And uh, and I you know uh, well uh, let's go on. <laughs> I wanted to say something about uh, across the street from Monte Safari, under the street, talking about paradox, under the street is that old Roman sister. So, do you know that I've been down? I've been, and it, 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 it's fascinating in its own way. And it's also fascinating in terms of a juxtaposition. I think, in, in my view, it's easier to associate the methodology, if that's what it is, with the Caltrans project and with the Hajja Sophia project. Oh, I think, I think both of those are social advocacies. I think their, their aspirations don't necessarily conform to the sociology of their time. You don't actually get a lot of social activity in Caltrans, but it's suggestive of something over a period of time, which is at least an aspiration. It's a public aspiration, and an aspiration for... But the, uh, the system of the system were not built as public spaces, although they are now accessible to the public. Right. But there was no effort to communicate meaning through the system. No. It was simply a service. And it happens that they're very moving. They are. They are. And, but Caltrans, by contrast, is a public building. I don't know that, to what extent, I'm sure you, it, that, that space is actually used for public events. But to me, it doesn't even matter so much because the form, including, by the way, I mean, everything that he did there, the way the commissioner are, is it a key sign who did, who did the light work in some of these cases? It looks like he's something, but I don't know who it is. Is it he's I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, the integration of the public art, and this is why I, you know, I, I think uh, whatever the means, however advanced the technique, however advanced the technology, the methodology used to conceive and execute the building, the intent of the architect through his intelligence or her intelligence of Uh, communicating meaning is crucial. So that, for example, the percent for art, which is so often rendered totally banal, 
by the way, was implemented. Plot or whatever that's been dropped down because there's a space and we need to decorate it. Uh, an aspect of the Caltrans that really is very admirable is the way the public art is used to enhance the meaning of the building. It's not, it cannot be taken away, the building would be less than the art. But the architecture would be incomplete without that work of public art. And to me, that's the way public art, the way art should be used in the building, where uh, if you take it away, the architecture would be incomplete. And that, that there's something else about that since all my life, actually practically every project that my colleagues and I have done in the last 15 years, almost all of them involved in commission works of art. And it's a very big issue for me, this question of not having, how, how not to have the artwork superfluous in many somehow added meaningless decoration. Of, and the litmus test for me is always um, is the architecture complete without the art? It, sh it should not be complete without the intervention of the artist. And uh, uh, that to me means, for example, that there has to be engagement between the artist and the architect. And both have to acknowledge the presence of the other, both have to give something and receive something from the other uh, in order to, to make that interaction happen. Because if it doesn't happen, it reduces the value of both of the work of art and of the architecture. Let me jump back to the cistern for two minutes just to make it point. But across the street from Hodges of my underground, and here it is absolutely right, is an old Roman cistern. And the cistern, correct me if I'm wrong, the cistern is supported on a series of columns. And the columns, and this was built by the Roman, Romans, come from Greek temples in the area. And there are a series of columns, maybe eight meters apart, in a room which is which is relatively high with relatively little natural light. It's light. It's it's lit with with, with candles. And I, it's it's probably a space eight times as big as this room. It's a big volume, essentially dark. Water is sitting on the floor. Well, like fifty. At least the part that I was in. Okay, you're big. Okay. Big. And in in two cases, there are columns, the capitals which belong to, to the Greeks and to the Medusa, which used to be which used to be capitals and then now form the base of the column. And the Medusa is flipped upside down. So the head of the Medusa is upside down and partially in the water. And the water can be very deep, it's probably a meter or less, it's not very deep. There's another column like that where the Medusa is actually turned sideways. So there, there's an interesting discourse that has to do with what the motivations were on the part of the builders, on the part of the Romans, were taking a vocabulary that belongs to their predecessors, the Greeks, and using that in a very different way, in a technical way, in an engineering way, not in a religious way, not in a social way, and inverting, and it seems to me it's hard to imagine anybody doing that except intentionally, to take the top and make it the bottom, and flip it upside down. So it, it, it seems to me they were for setting up a dialogue, or maybe from their point of view, a monologue that would run for centuries. It has to do with the interrelationship of these two very powerful cultures. And this is a very different kind of language and exchange of information. It's not clear what the purposes were. It's clear that there is a technical purpose and an engineering purpose 
But there's also a, a, a question of vocabulary and language and space. But nominally, in the service of getting water to the city, it's a very different kind of project, but it was always of interest to me to have one which, which, which had very clear social and organizational, not to say technical issues, in a formal way that belong to the world above ground and then the world below ground. It's like being in Ravenna in one, in, in one sense and then being in the catacombs in a different sense. It's a very different kind of language. It's worth looking at. It was certainly useful, useful to me to see what seemed to be an intentional kind of uh, an intentional kind of defiling of the culture that preceded you. But of course, that defilement was characteristic of every culture up to modern times, which is curious when you think the amount of attention that is being given today to preservation. Um, you know, you don't have to go back very far in history, certainly not more than 500 years, to find a time when uh, fragments of the architecture of previous eras were being reused or regularly built, built, built in, yeah. oh, literally reused uh, in, in different contexts. Los Angeles is one of the oldest. 
Texas cities. Secondly, it's another one that has a totally different history. So, so um, the space in which Trinity Church's place is the most important civic space in Boston. As we say, the same history in church and this public library designed by McKim. So here you have two of the most important 19th century architecture, which is in McKim, both present in one space. Uh, and uh, what was considered uh, impossible by everyone most especially by the architects of Boston, was the concept of putting a tall building next to the church. It was the concept that was considered in Boston. Now, I believe, that, and, and by the way, because it was considered conceptually impossible and nobody seemed to want to challenge that notion, it was therefore concluded that we had accepted this commission only on Marine that nobody could resist the commission to do a successful building, so we did it. As, you know, we were, uh, it was widely believed that we had literally prostituted ourselves professionally by accepting and carrying out that commission. Uh, now, the view that I had about that situation which grew out of my understanding of the history of that place, is which actually was in the talk that I gave three years ago, which I'm not going to repeat, but it drew me to the conclusion that in fact there was a need to show that architecture could in fact confront this ambiguity, this particular paradox, this particular conflict that it was necessary for the future life of Copley Square that the square discover how to engage the new scale of building that had surrounded it and of which it had been up to now the victim. I mean, there were lots of tall buildings all around the square that had nothing to do with it and which had rendered that space kind of meaningless and trivial, had taken away its value. And it was our view that this demand for a very tall building on well, this site was actually an opportunity uh, to join, if you will, the memory of the invention for the benefit of both. In other words, to show that architecture does indeed have the capacity to talk about and to make interesting that situation and to make it something other than simply the crushing of a monument by uh, by something happening next to it that is totally unconcerned uh, and irrelevant. So that was, uh, and, and again, as you can see, it once again engaged in my uh, abiding interest in this idea of paradox and ambiguity. There was a need, society, the society was asking for this transformation of scale in cities. This particular, uh, this ha happened to be a particular extreme case of it, but it happened in every city. It has been happening throughout the 50 years of my practice in every city. Uh, this demand for a change in scale, and usually that change in scale has been brought about in ways that have been very damaging to the identity of the cities involved, very damaging to the historic structure of that city, very damaging to its personality, devaluing it rather than adding to its value. The, what we set out to do with this building was to show that that was not a necessary consequence of creating this juxtaposition of scale, that in fact we could do it in a way that a reflection it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not the task of architecture to solve every problem, but it is the task of architecture, in my view, to illuminate every problem, to 
make people think about it, to, let, to invite people to think about the paradoxes that exist. <coughs> and I think architecture has that capacity, and I believe that it, it, now this really has been in existence for more than 30 years. And during that period, it has evolved from being probably the most hated building. Certainly, the most controversial building uh, of its time to a building that is almost now universally acknowledged to be an essential part of the identity of its city. In other words, it did not diminish the identity, but uh, contributed something to the identity of the city. And it, did, it does that precisely by the fact that it doesn't try to hide, to cover up to soften this confrontation. But it is the responsibility of the new building that is being added to that to do it in a way that, if you will, respects and allows the voice of the older building to still be heard. Let me ask you a couple of things about the bypass building here. Now you remember that building because there were, there were some technical issues with the building when I was in school. They're actually fascinating in terms of, of what represents a level of innovation, experiment, technique questions that have to do with building in a certain place on a certain site with a certain shape, with a certain wind. I don't remember all the issues you know better than, than, than we do. So there's, there was the issue of a building in Copley Plaza with McKinnon. Did Philip Johnson stuck that other piece in the back? It's a very different kind of discussion about old and new. Just for the record, if you if you dig up McKinnon Beaton White's library and you look at the back piece of the piece behind the Philip Johnson came along and did an addition to that, which is which is at, at some level to, to try to be fair about it. A kind, a kind of caricature of the building in a more contemporary idiom materially, but not shape-wise. So you have two examples in Copley Plaza. One where, where the building, where, where John Hancock had, in a sense, nothing to do with the precedence nothing to do with, with the order that existed a priori and came to make a different kind of order. Uh, and then there's the technical side of the discussion, which is, worth, uh, which, which is worth knowing about, which has to do with how do you build a building like that in that shape as an engineer. Could you go to the next one, because I just want to say something about that since you raised the uh, uh, I mean, this has to do with exactly what Eric was touching on, which is D is very, very important. When, I mean, this is, is uh, you know, obviously a minimalist strategy. It's a minimalist strategy not for ideological reasons. It's not because I believe in minimalism as an idea, uh, it, uh, as a transcendent idea. It's minimalism for circumstantial reasons because the situation of the building and that's why in this building everything has been edited out except what is uh, essential to create the relationship that we desire between the building and the church. That's why the building is so silent, almost mute, and that was is a limitation of its... It's mute because it has to allow the church to speak. Uh, now, part of that muteness, part of that essential muteness of the building is the scale of the glass panels. And Eric is right, that scale was unprecedented in insulated glass at that time. And uh, the scale is crucial to form the scale of vertical and horizontal. Uh, and if you go to the other that also will help us, the one that shows the broad face. You can see that also, that you can see. Now, that scale um, is of the essence. 
as in any minimalist work, everything counts. Every detail counts. There is no, for example, there is no, there are no projecting bodies in this building because one of the ways of making it work formally is to eliminate anything that might suggest a third dimension. It's about all about that surface. And the quality of that surface resides in uh, to some degree in the reflectivity, something else which in principle I'm not very fond of, but was necessary here. It resides in the reflectivity and it resides, it resides in the form, of course, and it resides in the scale of the subdivision of that wall. Now, when the glass failed, and uh, you may not put me much to you, this, but for what happened was that the glass began to break and fall out. And it was decided, well actually we decided because we perceived that there was a flaw, a technical flaw in the fabrication of the units. So we directed, somewhat over the objection of our client, we directed that every piece of glass in the building be removed. There are 10,334 panels. Each one is 12 feet high by about 5 feet. They were all removed and the entire building was covered with black flour. Quite a sight. Uh, and then the question came, well, what about replacing the glass? And of course the bureaucrats, and especially the company executives, might be using an insurance company, very risk averse to insurance. They found that they had built this enormous building which everybody hated. And then suddenly it became a laughing stock because the glass fell out and it turned into a plywood palace, 60 stories high. And they were completely, you know, the, they were deeply hurt. Their whole institutional identity had been compromised because this picture of black plywood, 60 stories in the air, appeared on the front pages of newspapers literally around the world. It was the most celebrated building failure, I think, since the collapse of the Cathedral of Beauvais, which happened in. 13th century. Uh, I mean, it was it was a very widely advertised thing. This is only my way of explaining why, when it came to replacing the glass, the executives of the Hancock Company, in their wisdom, said, "Well, we're not going to take any more chances. We want each of those panes to be divided into three pieces, like a conventional curtain. In other words, you have two spanker pieces and two pieces." divided into three pieces so that there will be no more risk taking, no more, you know, we're not going to go for that anymore. Well, this was actually, if I would have to identify the most critical moment in my entire professional life, it would be the moment when I needed to defend, successfully defend, the proposition that the glass must be replaced with panels of the same size. And I, I did that in part by taking a photograph of the building before the glass had come out. And, and that was before, digital, before the digital age, so we had to do it all by hand. We put pieces of black tape on the photograph to subdivide each panel. And I think you can imagine the effect that it would have on a surface of that size to separate those panels into three. I mean, it literally destroyed, totally destroyed the merit of the building architecture, the meaning of the building, the voice of the building. It would have been literally the end of my life in architecture had that happened. That's my view. And uh, and I took these images uh, to a meeting, uh, a board meeting, uh, and uh, I presented them, and then the executives of the company presented, who had formed a committee to study this, presented their unanimous recommendation that the body should be reclad with Three pieces of glass for everyone. Uh, well, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky in this respect that the chairman of the 
experience walking a line between two very different worlds that sometimes have a lot of difficulty conversing with each other and to some extent tend to look askance at one another, not to recognize one another, not to trust one another. And when you hear a story about a chairman of a board on an insurance company turning down the recommendations of, of his staff and his board and his peers, there has to be somewhere in the discussion the capacity of those who are arguing the position that he ultimately took to make that case, otherwise the building goes away, see you later, we're not having this discussion. It's really very, in this case, it was very simple. I can almost remember word for word what I said to the chairman at that time. I said, if you replace the glass with the panels of the same size, having been through all that you've been through in the last six years of construction, if you replace it that way, there is a chance that this building will recover its reputation and that the Hancock Company will benefit from that recovered reputation, that it will ultimately be admired. If you decide that the building, that the glass must be replaced with three pins for one, neither you nor I will ever be forgiven. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> and I think he understood it that it was that serious. Now, why would he even be interested in what I had to say? Because I had persuaded him, and this is, again, very important for you as architects to think about, I persuaded him that I was acting, that I had been acting for the past years since this accident began, and that I was at that moment acting in his interest, not in my interest. It was never about my aesthetic interest. It was about his interest and his responsibility to the company that this was about. You have to that's, the, that's what is crucial to me. And, and it's a fact of life. That's, it's a fact of life for architecture because architecture is such a contaminated art. It's contaminated by its engagement, inescapable engagement with all these power systems and with all these compromising situations with everything that we all have to go through. Uh, and uh, uh, somehow uh, you have to be able and willing and even somewhat interested in this necessary engagement. And, uh, the world is strewn, history is strewn with failed architects, sometimes very gifted designers, who simply couldn't get past their contempt for their clients, or their lack of interest in dealing with their clients. That's a good thing. Now that doesn't mean, and the world is also strewn with very bad buildings done by uh, by rather undistinguished architects who, who somehow managed to establish relationships of confidence with their clients. So establishing relationships of confidence does not guarantee good architecture. Uh, as a matter of fact, it most often has the opposite effect. But uh, it is, on the other hand, the only way that meaningful and important architecture happens is if there is that relationship. Let me ask you one other thing and then we'll go on to uh, whatever job go ahead. Um, you talk a little bit about paradox and conflict. Uh, it's never been my sense that those were your qualities, more so the qualities that you understood 
talked about St. Augustine, we used to talk about the city, not the city of God, but the city of man, as a city of conflict. And when you talked about what, what you guys did with John Hancock, you talked about minimalism, but again, not as an ideological predilection, but as a tactic. And I was looking on, the, on, on your website, and there's that tower in Madrid that you, uh, that you and your team were working on. And it would be interesting, but very briefly, to talk about a very different kind, utterly different strategic approach to a building, which to some extent, I mean, if you look at your work over a long period of time, looks to me like a series of tactical decisions made for reasons that you described, but never ideological decisions, which are the kinds of decisions that sometimes get involved with conflicts, fighting with architects. So, so there, there, there seems to be a capacity to make very different kinds of things with somewhat different local priorities. And, it, and the Madrid Tower seems to be that as it juxtaposed 30 years previously with, with uh, Copley Plaza. So maybe you could talk about one against the other a little bit. Well, I don't have it, I'm just going for the Tower is, uh, I mean, I'm just Thank you. 